There are so many me's inside of me. You are multiple consciousness. Hey, we're Kaken. My name's Tani. My name's Hannah. And I'm Izzy. So for Somerset House's grounding practice series, we're going to be doing a demo of some of our creative processes and just giving you a bit of a lowdown about how we approach making. So I guess to begin with, we'll just talk a little bit about like what is our process before we go into the software itself. We really take on this kind of world building approach to our practice and this has really helped us both within our like practical making of the work but also conceptually the kind of works that we create is we really make these like worlds or speculative futures or um imagining sort of the laws and structures that could exist in the metaverse and to enable us to communicate or talk about these things that means we need to imagine what sort of environments, what sort of avatars, what kind of stories, what kinds of um, issues could happen in the future. And so that means that we kind of end up doing a lot of different things. Yeah, and I think also the, because the, with world building, there's so many different kind of layers to it. I think the way we always approach is it's very much kind of like planting a seed in one area and then being able to kind of like um, to let that grow. We really, it's really happens a lot through the conversation with one another. So it, how we begin thinking about things will really influence like the development of the next stage, whether that's to do with like a character um, and the way that that character can like either behave or maybe what constricts its movements in some ways or whether that's like a, a world and what that world is whether it has different laws and structures that are different to the, to the reality that we live in or whether it's something that's kind of yeah more magical than that so to begin with I think we'll show you our um, mirror board because we we're going to show you some of the stuff that we are actually working on currently um, let me just share my screen. So this is like a, we did this a while ago, but it kind of gives a good nail of like where we are right now and like what we have to do to, in order to often like develop. This is actually specifically for CGI films or for virtual production. But as you can see here, there's like lots of stages. So like here there's like, uh, there's like the conceptualizing um, at the beginning, there's the like building the art department of like what you're making, the animating, the set dressing, cinematics, post-production equals CGI film. And you can see there's a lot of like things that you have to do within those processes. And then at the moment, we're really working on character design and as you can see here, it's like modeling character, hair, makeup, style, clothing, materials, textures, accessories, designing clothes, pattern making, rendering, Olympic, or purchasing like existing clothes and modifying that. Um, and what we'll show you now is like almost like an even more detailed pipeline of what we're doing within that framework itself. So at the moment, what we're going to kind of show you is just some character prototypes that we've been developing, but they're very much in <clears throat> in in this kind of like mid process stage. But yeah, it'll give you a good idea of how we kind of approach it on a kind of like ground up. Maybe I can just show you some of the stuff. So like at the beginning when we were looking at these new character designs, we were first looking at like. Uh, what like just creating in general like shapes or faces that we liked um just like modeling faces that we thought we'd like we also liked to do them these ones obviously they, they can't be they can't be rigged they'd be really hard to rig 
but we just use it, use the modeling tool in um, all the sculpting and cinema or and in Blender. And we just like, you know, just play around to see what kind of, what things we actually like or what are we drawn to. So we have a bit of freedom during that stage. Um, it's, there's not, yeah, it's not that crazy detailed, but then here is, um, here's a character that, um, we've been working on. Um, this character is actually, I guess probably what you guys are thinking of, what is this face over there, this giant doing, and that is the character. <laughs> One thing that we've been really trying to push with our, um, our kind of like character development is how we can kind of create really non-human, really quite different like characters and bodies that are not really so um are not typical to what you see in in unusual cgi and, and i think that's actually quite hard because a lot of the softwares and a lot of the tools that are available free they are it's, it is quite limited in what you can achieve and like we're working with softwares that have a lot of licenses and they, they do enable us to do a lot of really creative things so like we can send the character from character creator which is the software that i work in to ZBrush, which is the one that Hannah's uh, screen sharing now. And in ZBrush, we can make the character really like wildly different, but then actually to send it back to character creator, you have to really work, and like Hannah was saying, you have to really work within the actual framework of the character. Otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't relink back. And then if, if it doesn't relink back, that means that character can no longer be raped. It can no longer be animated in the same easy way is the pipeline we're working in. So you have to be quite mindful. Um, and we've just learned all this all through making a bunch of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm in a software called Character Creator um, at the moment. So as you can see, I have the model that Hannah's been working on um, set up here with some of the clothing that she's made, also some of the headpieces. Um, and what I basically, Hannah's made these kind of like uh, items inside of ZBrush, but I've brought them back into Character Creator and I've kind of uh, assigned them the properties of being the clothing or an accessory. And what that means is it, uh, it means that I can then um, animate this character and, and hopefully the clothing and those accessories should behave so they actually are accessories which is quite an important like, part of the animation process. I've, I've been building this very like preliminary uh, hair mesh that you can kind of see at the moment everything we haven't made the textures or the material so everything looks quite um, quite simplified at the moment but I've been working in Blender to create this this hair which is I guess it's like a two-layered um, hair piece, but uh, oh, nice. um, but it's a really great tool being able to make the hair inside of Blender, which is a, another free like um, 3D software that we use. That so you can actually do a bunch of stuff inside of it. You can do a lot of the character rigging and building and making directly inside of Blender, but for us, we we're just using a different pipeline through these real illusion softwares. Um, but it's normally, like, I've just found this tool for making hair and it, it builds the like texture and material for you. I need, definitely need to learn how to make things look a lot more layered, but you'll see in a minute when I show you in the gaming engine that I, I'm able to kind of apply physics to it. So it actually moves as though it is hair. Um, so once I've kind of done that and I've got this character kind of set up in Character Creator, I then send it to another software from the same company, um, iClone, and then in this software, I can actually animate it. So I can just show you, this is just like kind of a simple walking animation. Um, but this software is really good because I can, I can, we can use motion capture to create our own like unique animations or like at the moment I'm just using an inbuilt animation that I've modified a bit but I can also animate the face and like really bring this character to life which is really cool but we then actually 
come out of Cyclone, this software, and then go into Unreal. So as you can see, we've already mentioned like five or six different softwares, but I think that's just something that's quite normal when you're working within CGI. But I've got this character already kind of set up. It doesn't have the clothing, but I can show you um, how I've applied some physics to the hair. Um, and when I play this animation, you can see that the hair really actually starts to kind of move and flow a bit like hair does, which is another part of making our characters more realistic and more kind of, um, I guess a bit more, just a bit, I, I suppose we're trying to make things that are a bit more like not just out of the box because for a really long time we haven't known how to do all these different stages of production. So we've just used assets, that, used and, and kind of modified assets that we found online. But I think now we're at a stage where we're really trying to figure out how to do everything um, on our own. So then there's also in a similar way, I've got this skirt set up, which I've also applied like cloth physics to it. So it's not just kind of, it's not just static, like it is in icon. You can see when the skirt moves, it's really just like, it's moving like an actual object. So that doesn't look very good there, but inside of Unreal, um, now it's got a lot more motion, which feels nice. All these works are, still like they're not finished products they're all testers so there's all of them have like small mistakes on them that we're modifying correcting as we go along so from so from last year we've been making a haptic wearable womb we made the first prototype of it um, however we are now working to develop it even further by including um by improving the haptic technology also adding in LED lights, programmable LED lights, um, adding in heat falls, so to make the silicone pregnant um, womb feel more like a skin temperature and we're testing biometrics and other, other things. What I was just working on today is just what potential LED lights could be programmable into it. Um, at the moment, I've just got, this isn't, I'll show you, this is not, are real because we've also the real casted um silicon belly it's just a test just a test one one that we bought online yeah one that we bought online i've got a ring light with an arduino just an arduino uno um and then you can just find different codes online so the haptics haptics are they send vibrations um and sound and we programmed in animal noises before um, but we're going to work on building an even more spatial sound incorporating the lights so that um, there is a real feeling of there's a lot of movement and physicality and viscerality in in the in the womb we're, we're interested in make also as long as the, as well as the cgi and um, game design we're really interested in making our own technologies as we're also interested in making um, there's like physical and holistic experiences because it definitely does the haptic womb that is something that's very internal and holistic and it is really activating something inside you in a very sensorial way we're also really interested in how do you make technologies that feel more organic? I mean, think about the body, think about nature, that we're soft, organic technology already. Like our skin is the most amazing technology. It has full of senses. So how, what, why aren't there more technologies that are soft, that are more organic? That, And I think that can then activate and help you feel have a maybe a more healthier relationship with technology so we're trying to think about oh what technology could exist that could be more emancipatory or could be more holistic or could be more in tune with activating um our inter like our internal wisdom and not just when you're looking at the screen for a really long time and you actually feel really disconnected from your body so um thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> thank you.
Hi everyone, we're here today at Somerset House Studios for Grounding Practice, which is a series of talks which is in conjunction with Amplify Digital Arts Initiative. And today I am delighted to be joined by Hannah Amori, who is one third of Kaken. Um, unfortunately, Izzy can't be here with us today. And Tanya's in Berlin. Um, so I'm going to be asking you to speak about the collective, which I imagine you do all the time, so. Yeah, but normally with them, so. Yeah. yeah, well, before I do that, I'm just gonna quickly give an overview mm -hmm. of what we're doing today. We'll be touching upon different projects from Cake and your practice. We'll be looking at um, future projects in the pipeline and thinking about some of the contextual ideas around mm -hmm. the work. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Michelle williams Gamaker. I'm a filmmaker, I um, work with performance, making fiction film that really tries to look at this idea of fictional activism. So it's very nice mm -hmm. to be in a space with Kaken because um, the realms that you're creating feel um, connected to mine, except mine are really looking at kind of old school Hollywood and British cinema. Um, and probably coming from a more analog lens, but um, I think we can meet in the mm -hmm. middle with um, thinking about how fiction becomes a very useful tool for the um, work that we're trying to do. To introduce Kaken, you have a really wonderful bio that I feel obliged to kind of read from to kind of get to the nuance of some of the things that you're talking about. Um, you are a collective, uh, co-founded with Tanya Cruz, yourself, Hannah Amori, and Isabel Ramos in 2015. So you're based between London and Berlin, and um, you come from mixed diasporic backgrounds. I think it's important to note these Mexican, Japanese, European, Jewish um, heritage. And Kaken is a collective title taken from the Japanese word for experience. So this idea of lived experience being an idea at the core of your work and practice seems to be very important. Um, you collaboratively build and imagine a metaverse, which we can come to in detail a bit more, but um, to simulate new structures and ways of existing and to test drive possible futures. Yeah, this idea of the metaverse is a fully immersive virtual space of multiple worlds, which allows Kaken to become the architects and collaborators of the future, which I really love as a possibility. Um, and you talk about this as piercing our perceptions of reality and defying all that we know. I love that kind of almost anarchic tearing down of structures yeah, that we, we can like come to. to. <laughs> okay. Kaken creates these speculative worlds through filmmaking, gaming, installation, extended reality, blockchain and performance. So welcome uh, and it's really a pleasure to, to meet you, Hannah. I've been delving into some of the games and having a look at your website, which really does give us ways in. I, mm -hmm. I, I guess I'd love to start with asking you about um, the collaboration how the th three of you met and mm -hmm. what motivated the first few projects? Mm -hmm. So Tani and I knew each other from college. So we kind of, we grew up in Cornwall and we connected together because I'm half Japanese and Tani's half Mexican. So being in Cornwall, there's not much diversity. So being half of something really, it's like almost like your identity of the other culture is almost exasperated because there's no one else like you don't know anyone else of different cultures. So I think we super bonded with this connection with one another. And we also connected with one another over our love for nature and adventure. And then Izzy and Tani did the foundation at Falmouth. And then I went straight onto the um the fine art degree and we all became friends there and it was it started off just through our friendship and I don't the thing that's kind of funny is I actually I kind of think that it was Izzy's idea because I could just imagine it being her idea and I think actually even her dad said to her you should start a collective or something like that and so 
Um, so yeah, we never ever thought about um, starting a collective. It wasn't a thought in our mind. But one day we just decided to do it and we sat down in Izzy's bedroom and Izzy had like this very distinctive bedroom because it had flamingo wallpaper, giant flamingos. And I remember this yeah. like purple sketchbook and we spent the whole day sketching out like what are different practices and um, what are our interests. And we came to the conclusion of this word experience. And then the, and that, that means like whether that's to do with like the nature of consciousness or pushing the boundaries of experience within art. Mm. And um, a few days later, Tani and Izzy came up to me really excited, like, I think we have a name, K Ken. And then it really has just been the anchor to like really push like what is our, like what is it that we want to be doing? What is our motivation? And I think mm. it was just somehow it just, it just was and it is. And then we just took it super seriously. We had no idea what we were doing. We actually started off like, well, the thing about starting a collaborative practice is it's very hard to get to the point where you are completely interconnected in a way that's just fluid. Mm. You have this language with one another and you can bring in other collaborators and share that language with one another. And I think at the beginning, we were very much like just trying to figure that out. So we did a lot of random different things. We did like book fairs at like Counter in Plymouth and we would do really embarrassing things that I don't want to talk about. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and so those are kind of our first few projects. We created a Tumblr blog. We would just put our images next to each other. We'd go travel together and do something, like, like figure out some random trip, like anything. We were just trying to learn how to exist with one another and it's many 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 years later we started to form an identity with one another but that that took time yeah yeah I think time's really important but I suppose as somebody who teaches in mm -hmm. at Goldsmiths there's um I guess there's a pressure on an artist to individualize and find their practice mm -hmm. um from a personal space that sometimes negates collective um, exploration mm -hmm. together. And I think what's really, yeah, maybe the radical potential of the work is that you have taken the time to get to know one another and to kind of build what is a very densely layered world, mm -hmm. um, or worlds plural, um, mm -hmm. which I guess I'd like to delve a bit more into that, the fact that life of working out the work sort of sits in the bedroom and probably sits in collective trips. How did, how did you begin to um, understand that this was something that needed um, fleshing out into, um, I suppose, that speculative gaming mm -hmm. world making that you've started to really craft so well? The thing is, it's kind of always there. You just got to mm. find it. Do you know what I mean? So mm. it's like we all have those like strands and thoughts within us. And we we re we quite quickly realized world building was a massive part of the practice, because if you collaborate with someone and I think at the beginning stages, we were very much like we wanted everyone to join us and we didn't understand why like why doesn't everyone just want to be part of it and it feel like theirs? Because the thing is, actually, it's not theirs because we co-founded it. So mm -hmm. what we have to do is we have to learn how to nurture both their individual and collective um, collectivity. So you need to be able to have some sort of form of exchange. You need something that's like mm -hmm. uh, an open source way of working. Because when you work with somebody else, you have to... Um, it's things become, yours becomes theirs and theirs becomes yours. So you kind of, yeah, there's always this form of exchange and open source way of working, but then there's also the individual. So I think we, world building really facilitates that because if you think of worlds, worlds are created through the collectivity of people and through the individual. So it's really, that, that became a very natural way of working. And also to be able to, like, how do I fulfill my partner that I'm working with when our lives are different and we have different experiences? How do we grow throughout the years and still be connected and be able to, like, have the same vision? That's actually an incredibly tough 
thing to be able to do. And, you know, we don't have the same experiences. And we don't have the same backgrounds. How do we do that? So I think, I think to do to do that, I think world building was a huge part of that because we need to create a really open space which can include everyone. And by creating these imaginary spaces, we could include everyone. Yeah, and and what seems so exciting is the um, infinite possibilities mm -hmm. within the worlds, which I suppose um, means that the three of you can fill it with multiple desires or yeah exactly yeah. and it's like also trying to solve things in the world, real world is really difficult <laughs> whereas if you imagine it and solve it somewhere else that you've imagined sometimes it does the trick it really does make you feel better and you do actually resolve a lot like we're, we're really into um you know like as you said you, you're lots of like activism within your work we mm. like to be the activists in our metaverse yeah. but yeah. That, that's how we, we want to resolve things in fictitious ways. It's really important to us. Yeah, I should clarify that the activism I'm doing is also fictional activism. Yeah. And I think it's really important yeah. to make that distinction because mm -hmm. there are activists um, who yeah. are on the line. Exactly. And I do that form of activism too. But the f like you, I'm really interested in what might happen in potentially mm -hmm. re resolution of um, structural inequality in a fictional realm. I suppose maybe that leads on to this idea in Beta Bodies of the um, wearable haptic womb, where you're really starting to kind of explore the creation of empathy through a piece of wearable technology. Could you say a bit more about that project? Because yes, I feel so. that when looking through your work, that one really touched me because um, it, it really became a kind of possible way to physically connect with an experience. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'd love to know more about how that piece developed. Yeah, so Better Bodies is a haptic wearable womb and it's made out of silicone and it's the reason it's called better bodies is because it's almost like better is like beta so we've been trying to make up this technology and the reason why we created the technology was because in 2017 we did a durational performance over three days with many different um, performers wearing these just normal just like well normal normal wearable wounds <laughs> <laughs> it will become normal yeah. like wearing um silicone pregnant be bellies we did it uh, for the london design festival so loads of different performers of different age gender sex they all wore the belly and people had such a crazy reaction to the womb and you know because the um because the architecture of the womb is like so important to the foundations of who we are yet we forget about the architecture and why we need it but of course it's our first beginnings of a safe protected nurtured space it's a very genderless thing the yeah. womb and we we knew that this was an important um connection tool for humans and it activates a lot of emotions and thoughts and memories and feelings we wanted to think first about how do how do we uh, care for things beyond our unvelt. So our unvelt is the like our uh, our perception of like the so our unvelt is the human organism sort of how we perceive. So it's, and then um, I think we see one tenth of trillion tenth of a trillionth of all the different perceptions that you can perceive. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, everything that exists doesn't exist. Yeah. That's <laughs> and that we know nothing, and everything can change. But um, but yeah. So we um, we wanted to find a way of using the architecture of the womb to be able to implant um, at something to do with animals. So we started with animal noises and we used animal sounds from um, other animals that communicate through ultrasound. So we really like the idea of like, what happens when you have a sense that you, you don't share the same sense as them, but how do you observe them and think about them when you can't, your percept, the way you perceive cannot go beyond that barrier. 
And we need, you know, it's very hard to care for things that are different to ourselves. Or we don't have connections. You know, we know, we all know this. Like, you know, if we see something horrific going on, or for in a maybe in a country that we don't relate to, we just can't concentrate that well on it, or we find it hard too because we can't. Our data, memories, and experiences are just not the same as that. And I think that you know the boundaries of empathy are actually like that's the the problem of empathy empathy is a problem because it's incredibly biased and compassion is something that's very hard to achieve mm. so it's like how do we do how do we do this and this is something we question con and interrogate within our work constantly because working collaboratively you have to empathize with one another and you have to empathize with one another for maybe experiences that you don't share right um and I think, and also being diasporic, I think it really makes us think about that a lot because we had very um, different parents, like our parents were very different and they were different from each other because of their cultures. Um, but yeah, so we're constantly, th th this is kind of like our idea and thoughts around the womb and we program the womb and what was incredible with the uh, so we use um, noises, well, sounds of like dolphins, whales, bats, tarsiers. And what was super incredible was when you put where the womb, the way the sound travels w through the silicone is the silicone almost creates some sort of like atmosphere. And then the sound travels through it and almost creates shapes but it feels like it's part of you. So... Does, can I ask you, does the, does the experience of the, the sound kind of vibrate into the wearer's body? Like, could, yes. Because I'd be really interested mm. to know if that's... Yeah, so it does. So, like, uh, the, the haptics are actually very... They have to be next to your skin, basically. You do often people are wearing, you know, clothes and stuff like that because you do also have to really think about. For example, everybody has different associations and positive and negative feelings or neutral feelings towards their belly, but you don't know how somebody may feel about their body in that specific area. So it was really important to us, like the womb. Currently, the state that it's in is kind of curved, and actually, we did make a strap, but the problem with the strap was even the time it takes on and the feeling of putting something on is actually can be um, a barrier in itself. And so at the moment, it's, you can experience like it's sat down or lying down, and you can kind of just put it on top of you. And it, what's amazing is it fits every body type. The womb fits everyone, even children. It fits male, female, any gender. It, it fits everyone. <laughs> I think these small exercises that, you know, on a much lower fi level, like, um, you know, children at primary school having to kind of watch chicks hatch mm. or caring for a boiled egg and hoping that it doesn't crack, you know, or, mm. well, maybe not a boiled egg, but, you know, an egg mm. that you care for, that it's, it feels like part of the practice is also kind of offering your participants a chance to really step into the consciousness and the lived realities of other people, um, mm -hmm. which feels, I'm trying to think of a practice that does that. There's not that many mm -hmm. that um, offer this as a possibility. I guess I wanted to also touch upon the therapeutic potential in the work. I don't want to use that word lightly, but in how you were talking about better bodies, there seem to be moments, particularly for your friend, where there's a kind of real uh, brush with something existential or something um, that can really touch upon a very deeply emotional space. And I think sometimes um, the technical realm or world of gaming computers can be kind of much maligned for being not that space. Mm -hmm. So I just maybe just to wrap up some thoughts around how the work actually um, heightens ex emotional experience as opposed to this kind of glib critique of technology as this kind of de uh, sent this kind of desensory space. That's not really a word, but you know, like a kind of desensitized space. 
most technology that we use to our day to day doesn't have the a deep philosophical and uh, understand. It's not. It's not to like nurture us for like who we are as people. They're like practical tools to to. Uh, it's almost a bit like drug. <laughs> it's like a bit like a drug. It's like a you know it t it's addictive. It takes it's, it really activates the seeking part, which is the of your brain, which you know. So it so the disposition that um, most tools and technologies say that we use for our day to day. So for example, if we use Instagram or we use Facebook or something like that, this is scrolling. So scrolling is the a tool to activate seeking. And seeking, yeah, as I said, is the kind of natural state of disposition. But what we're trying to do is think of every single emotion. So joy, fear, happiness, you know, sadness. Like you, the, the work has to encompass all those like elements of feelings. And we, we really do spend a lot of time critique, like analyzing and researching different uh especially neuroscientists actually we look a lot into neuroscience and how does the brain structure how does the mind and body work and what do we need to fulfill ourselves what do we need to activate what do we need to deactivate when we experience a piece of work so we're really thinking of it on even like a you know it doesn't look scientific but we are trying to think of it also like on a scientific level and um a spiritual level like um transporting your consciousness into a different realm is a spiritual act you know putting on a vr is transporting your consciousness in a different into a different realm you know it's not a hey guys look at this vr technology like do you want to see this super cool sunset in the vr it's like it's not like that like that <laughs> that's not what we're thinking about and we do talk which critique and create these spaces that we think are um are gonna end in problematic ways because we want to you know, explore them and see why they would, you know, we've got to um, role play them out to figure out where they might go. But, you know, we're, yeah, I just think the way that we're thinking about things is completely different, like it's different, it's for different needs and different purposes. Very tongue in cheek. You know, mm -hmm. You're going to be the divine mother. You're going to sit, remain on your moral high horse. You yeah, know, I loved that. You know, you're going to be a human god, and I just think these are. It's just really fabulous. Yeah. Experience. Hannah, thank you so much for speaking to us today and for speaking about Kaken's practice. So that's to your collaborators too, who are absolutely in the room in through yeah. this conversation. <laughs> Um, I've also really enjoyed being in the work a bit. Um, I think I just wanted to say one thing that I'm going to take away from this conversation is this idea of um, that you brought up about open source ways of working and that that seems to be really deeply rooted in the nature of Kaken because I think you're supporting some sort of idea of multiplicity um, and this transformative nature of welding. So. I'm just going to take that um, as something that I think I'd really like to encourage my students to think through as well. And I just wanted to say that this is um, a conversation that is part of a wider series of grounding practice for Somerset House Studios. If you want to know more about this program, you could take a look at the website and uh, visit the social media for other upcoming talks and events.